Hey everyone, my name is Asaf Rose Marine and I'm going to present a joint work with my advisor Nathan Keller, Mind the Middle Layer, the Hades Design Strategy Revisited. Before we dive into the details, I'll start with a short summary. As you could probably guess by the name, our results concern the middle layer of the Hades design, which is a combination of SPN rounds and partial SPN rounds, which we call the middle layer, as you see in the figure. It's okay if we don't fully understand for now, we'll get back to that later. Specifically, we consider the instantiations of the Hades design, which are Poseidon and Starkin. For Poseidon, we show how an analysis of the middle layer can be used to increase the security guarantee against statistical attacks. As you can see in the figure, for some of the Poseidon variants, the middle layer provides even better security against statistical attacks than the full rounds. For example, for the T equals 6 variant, the full rounds ensure only 28 active SXs, while the middle layer ensures 32. Again, it's okay if we don't fully understand what it means for now. We will get back to it with more detail. These results mean that the same level of security against this type of attacks can be achieved while using less full rounds, which can result in a significant speedup of the cipher. In StarCAD, however, it was not the case. We show that for some of the StarCAD variants, there exists a huge invariant subspace which doesn't activate any SPOPs in the partial rounds. What we mean by invariant here is that the linear transformation used in StarCAD maps this subspace to itself. What it means is that for every difference delta from our invariant subset V, and every two inputs X and Y with this difference, the difference of the output is determined completely by delta. Notice that the difference is XOR here as a work of our binary field. This is obviously an undesirable property of the cipher. As we'll see later in the presentation, we get this result by an analysis of Cauchy matrices, which is the family of matrices the authors of StarCAD chose to use. In a paper by Bain et al., which appeared in CRIP 2020, the authors show how to attack StarCAD assuming the StarCAD matrix satisfies some conditions. We show that these conditions hold for some of the variants, which break the security guarantee of the cipher for some of the parameters. Now, let's get into the details. Before explaining the rationale of the Hades design, let's go over SPN and partial SPN designs. SPN, which stands for Substitution Permutation Network, is a very widely used construction, used in the AES for example, in which every encryption round consists of key addition, linear operation, and non-linear operation, called s boxes and applied to each block of the cipher separately. Partial SPN is a newer design, in which only some of the states go for an S-box in each round. In the Hades design, the first and last few rounds are full SPN rounds, while the middle layer consists of partial SPN rounds. The idea behind the Hades design is to use the full rounds to ensure security against statistical attacks. If there are known methods to do this, as was done in AES, and use the middle partial rounds to ensure security against algebraic attacks. As even a partial round with one S-box, as in the case in the Hades design, has the same algebraic degree as that of the full round. This design is meant for cases in which the main computational bottleneck are the S-boxes, and linear operations take negligible time in comparison, like in MPC. Hades is a generic design and not a specific cipher, so let's talk about its instantiations, namely StarCAD and Poseidon. Each of Poseidon and StarCAD can be parameterized. We denote by T the number of blocks in a variant, which is the number of S boxes in a full round. In all of the variants, only one block out of T goes to an S box in the partial round. The number of full rounds before and after the middle of partial rounds is always 4, while the number of partial rounds in the middle changes between the variants. The matrix chosen for the transformation is MDS matrix. What it means for us is essentially that in every two adjacent full rounds, at least two plus one network sets are active. We'll see in the next slide exactly what it means. So, the security guarantee of both Poseidon and StarCAD is 4 times two plus one active network sets in each characteristic. In the previous slide, I talked about active s boxes as a measure of security against differential and linear cryptanalysis. To better understand what it means, I'll give a little background about differential cryptanalysis. In differential cryptanalysis, we start with two inputs, 
with a known difference and try to keep track of the difference at every stage of the recruitment process. In our case, we're interested only at of SPN and partial SPN, in which the cipher consists of linear operations, in which by linearity, if the difference was delta, then the output difference must be m of delta, key addition, which obviously does not change the difference, and S boxes. So for S boxes, if the input difference was zero, it will remain zero, as a zero difference means the outputs were the same, so they will stay the same. Otherwise, we cannot know the output difference for sure, and in that case, we say that the Xbox is active. If we would like to know the output difference, we could only know it at a certain probability. So, if we lower bound the number of active Xboxes, it means that the probability of every characteristic will be very low. Now that we understand the terminology, let's get back to our result on Poseidon. To get a lower bound on the number of active Xboxes in the partial rounds, we use the tool presented in the paper from 2015 by Baron et al. Let's look at some examples. For t equals 4, the lower bound of the active Xboxes in the full rounds is 20, and for the partial rounds is at least 36. For t equals 6, it is 28 Xboxes for the full rounds, and 32 for the partial rounds. Notice that for all of the variants presented in the table, except for the t equals 16, the partial rounds provide better security than the full rounds. As the main purpose of the full rounds is to ensure security against statistical attacks, and we've seen that the partial rounds can provide the same level of security, the possible impact would be to reduce or even completely remove the full rounds. This can cause a massive speedup to the cipher. However, after considering Considering our results, the designers of Poseidon decided to not currently reduce the number of full rounds, that they may still provide better resiliency against algebraic attacks. When we started analyzing StarCAD, we tried to use the exact same method we used for Poseidon and get a lower bound using the automatic tool. We were very surprised to see that the tool could not provide any lower bound. Instead, for the variant with 24 blocks, we found a subspace of dimension 18, which does not activate any S-box in the whole middle layer. As it turns out, this subspace is an invariant subspace. What it means is that differences that start in the subspace will always stay in the subspace, and so will never activate any S-box, regardless of how many partial bounds there are. After we found this, we naturally wanted to understand why it happened, so we started studying the family of matrices started uses, which are Cauchy matrices. Specifically, the ij entry of the matrix is the inverse of xi plus yj, or xi and yj are just following integer represented as elements in the field of size 2 to the power of n. Our results on StarCAD are the following three theorems. The first is for the special case in which the number of blocks t is a power of 2, 2 to the k in which case we prove that there exists an invariant subspace that does not activate any S-box in the partial rounds, and its dimension is at least t-2, which is very high. The second theorem handles the, special, the general case, in which the number of blocks is s times 2 to the power of k, where s is odd, in which case we prove the lower bound of the dimension t minus k plus 1 times s. Notice that if we evaluate here s equals 1, we get that the dimension is at least t minus k minus 1. So the second theorem does not imply the first theorem. This, the third theorem, which shows in the paper as a conjecture, however, we proved it since submitting the paper, so it's now a theorem, is that the dimension of the invariant subspace in the general case is at least t minus 2 times s, which is very neat. As in this case, if we evaluate s equals 1, we get the first theorem. So the last theorem implies both the first and the second theorem. Notice also that for the t equals 24 variant, which we looked at earlier, if we evaluate the conjecture, we get the dimension of the invariant subspace is 18, which matches exactly what we practically found. The way we proved the three theorems we just saw is by studying the minimal polynomial of the matrix. As it turns out, proving a higher bound of D on the degree of the minimal polynomial of M 
immediately translates to a lower bound of t minus t on the dimension of the invariant subspace. The reason why it happens is that higher powers of m are all spanned by m to the power of 0 until m to the power of d minus 1. We can easily see this by using division with remainder of x to the power of n by the minimal polynomial m of x. Now, if we evaluate both sides of the equation by the matrix m, as the evaluation of the matrix on its minimal polynomial is 0, we get that m to the power of n is equal to r of n, which is of course spanned by power of m smaller than d, as its degree is less than d. The conditions for some input difference v to not activate any s-box is that the first block of v is 0, so that the first s-box is not activated, and then the first block of m times v also has to be 0, so that the second s-box is not activated, and so on. So, for every round i, we get a linear constraint on m to the power of i times v. As we just saw, the powers of m are of dimension at most d, so these are only d-linear constraints, and thus the dimension of the solution space must be at least t minus d. If we recall the three theorems from the previous slide, the first claims the dimension of at least t minus 2, so we need to upper bound the degree of the minimal polynomial by 2. The second theorem claims the dimension of at least t minus s plus 1 times k, which means we need to upper bound the degree of the minimal polynomial by s plus 1 times k. The third claims the dimension of at least t minus 2s, so we'll need to show that the degree is at most 2 times s. To prove these results, we study a class of matrices which we name spatial matrices. Spatial matrices are a class of square matrices of sizes which are powers of 2. It is defined using this recursive definition. Every 1 by 1 matrix is special, and bigger spatial matrices are symmetric block matrices of 2 by 2 spatial matrices. From this definition, it's pretty clear why the size of spatial matrices must be a power of 2. Spatial matrices are a commutative subring of the ring of matrices. What it means is if we add the two matrices, spatial matrices together, we will get a spatial matrix. If we multiply two spatial matrices together, we will still get a spatial matrix. And spatial matrices commute with, with each other. The interesting stuff happens when the spatial matrices are over rings of characteristic 2, such as binary fields, which are the case in StarCAD. Notice that it's important to generalize from binary fields to binary rings, as matrices with polynomials as entries are interesting when analyzing the characteristic polynomial, which is related to the minimal polynomial. From now, we'll only talk about special matrices over such rings. The first property we're going to discuss is that every special matrix is a single eigenvalue, which we denote by lambda of m. The eigenvalue is additive, and the determinant is also additive, which is pretty unusual. Finally, m squared is a scalar matrix, and the scalar is the eigenvalue of m squared. So, why should we care about these spatial matrices? As it turns out, when t is a power of 2, the StarCAD matrix is a spatial matrix. Notice, however, that it is not true in general for Cauchy matrices. There are way more Cauchy matrices than there are spatial matrices. While not every Cauchy matrix is a special matrix, every special matrix is a Cauchy matrix. So the special matrices are a cool subclass of the Cauchy matrices. The reason why the Cauchy matrices used by StarCAD are special matrices is the specific choice of the sequences xi and yi as following integers starting from zero, which gives the matrix this special structure. Using what we've seen earlier, as m squared is a scalar matrix, the minimal polynomial is of degree at most 2 and we got a lower bound of t minus 2 on the dimension of the invariant subspace, which proves the first theorem. In the general case, where t is equal to s times 2 to the power of k, the StarCAD matrix is a block matrix of s by s blocks, each of which is a spatial matrix of size 2 to the power of k by 2 to the power of k. We're going to use that fact to prove the second and third theorems. As the StarCAD matrix in the general case is a block matrix of spatial matrices, we proceed to study this type of matrices. What we prove is the following. Take such a matrix, M, and replace 
each block with its unique eigenvalue, lambda of n. What we get is a S by S matrix, denoted characteristic polynomial by Q, which is of degree S. And what we prove is that the minimal polynomial of M divides Q to the power of K plus 1, which is of degree K plus 1 times S, which gives us the bound of the second theorem. The conjecture is that the minimal polynomial also divides Q to the Q squared, which would give us the bound of the third theorem. Some of you may remember that I promised in the summary that the invariant subspace can be used to enable an algebraic attack on StarCAD. While it's obvious how such an invariant subspace is useful when attacking the cipher using differential or linear attacks, it may not be so clear how to use it for other purposes. Remember that not activating any S-box means that if we take two inputs, x and y, with difference equal to some delta from the subspace, then the difference between the outputs of the middle layer of x and y, fx and fy, is equal to L of delta, or L is some power of the round matrix N. If we choose some x from the subspace and y equals 0, we will get that f of x, where f is the middle layer, is equal to L of x plus f of 0, which is a constant. So, what we got is that the middle layer acts like an affine transformation for inputs from the subspace, which has algebraic degree of 1. As the main purpose of the middle layer is to increase the algebraic degree, this invariant subspace is obviously bad news. We didn't use the invariant subspace ourselves to attack the cipher, but left it to future work. In a parallel research by Bain et al., which was published in Crypto 2020, it was discovered that if, hypothetically, the StarCAD matrix has a small multiplicative order D, then it is possible to mount an algebraic pre-image attack on StarCAD. From their proof, it is fairly easy to see that the exact same holds for matrices whose minimal polynomial has the grid most D, which is exactly what we proved. So, the invariant subspaces can be used to attack StarCAD and the attack even breaks the security guarantee for some choices of parameters. As we've seen from StarCAD, a bad choice of the matrix can lead to the existence of big invariant subspaces that pass the entire middle layer without activating the single S-box. In contrast to Poseidon, in which the middle layer could dramatically increase the security against differential and linear attacks, in StarCAD the middle layer does not increase the security with respect to these attacks at all, and even algebraic attacks can be launched against the cipher. Most importantly, preventing, preventing the invariant subspace is really easy. Here, all we need to do is choose any t which is not divisible by 4. Following our results, the authors of Poseidon and StarCAD recommended to use only Poseidon, and if using StarCAD anyway, use it only with an odd t. The lesson from the talk is to not disregard the middle layer in the security analysis. As we've seen, the middle layer can both boost the security guarantee of the cipher and be very dangerous when the matrix is not chosen properly. So, it is very important to always take it into account and use it in the security analysis. Thank you very much for listening. Hope you enjoyed the talk. If you did, you're welcome to view the papers to see all the proofs in detail. And that's it. Thank you very much.